Hi, I'm Aidan, and I'm here at CERN for the US LHC Blocks. And hi, I'm Seth. And we're here to talk about the latest Higgs updates from the HCP conference. So that took place this week in Kyoto in Japan, and there were updates presented from Atlas, CMS, and the Tevatron experiments on the Higgs searches. Yeah, and uh, so far we what we see is that our results are firming up, and what we have looks like the standard model Higgs boson, mm -hmm. which I think some people think is, is exciting, and other people start to get worried about, because once we have something, the most boring thing it could be is the standard model Higgs boson, because it's what we're expecting. Right, and we're starting to get information about that now. So back in July, both experiments obviously presented the um, discovery of a boson, and now we're getting to the point where we're going beyond discovery. We're now measuring the, uh, the finer points of this and to see whether it fits in with what we expect. And uh, depending on what you think is exciting, you're either going to be quite happy about some of the convergences or if you're more excited about uh, non-standard model Higgs, you're going to be more excited about the uh, slight discrepancies. We've got the most statistics things are still fluctuating up and down. And so we've got a really good opportunity to compare these different things and see what's telling us. So uh, we see, for example, in the um, CMS update to the CZ channel, uh, we can get a handle on the spin of this particle and also its parity, uh, which is sort of a it's, well, it's a, it's a quantum mechanical number that relates how the particle changes if you were to reflect it through a mirror. And it affects actually how the particle decays and what directions the particles from that decay go. So by measuring angles between things in the ZZ analysis, we can see, does, does this have what we expect from the standard model Higgs, or is it something else very strange? Um, so we've, we've done this, and so far the result is that it looks much more consistent with the standard model. Um, we, have, we have it sitting, they, they can make these plots where it's basically sitting right where you expect. Um, if it were from the standard model and about two and a half sigma off from it being this um, alternative with opposite parity. I was really impressed that these easy start on this to measure this because the statistics of this channel are very, very low. And you're basically doing an angular analysis, right? You've got this spectrum that you look at and then you try to fit to that. And you can use things like uh, multivariate analyses, but still you've got, very, uh, you've got a very small number of events to look at. Well, it's a really small number of beautiful events, I think, <laughs> I think is the point, right? You have four well-measured uh, leptons, electrons, and muons. So you really know uh, where they're coming from, where they're going, and how much energy they had with tremendous precision. Um, so, you know, this, this compares then to the analysis I work on, Higgs to BB bar, um, where there's just, the, the events are complicated, up the B quarks have decayed and showered um, with a whole bunch of hadrons into big jets, we call them, piles of, piles of crap, essentially, except they're special because there was a bee quark in them, so we can um, eliminate some of the background jets that the LHC makes all the time using that, and then we have a whole bunch more tricks, on and on and on our tricks go. And at the end of the day, um, we can just barely see a tiny little peak and actually what both Atlas and CMS did in that channel, most recently, is, is subtracted off all the backgrounds except the Higgs and standard model diboson production. And you can now see a peak that's actually mostly due to dibosons, which were only very recently actually measured anywhere in the Tevatron. So it's exciting to see that. It's a good validation of the analysis. But we're actually not quite yet to the point in BB bar where we can say we, we've seen the Higgs decay there at all. Um, so, but again, in ZZ, when they see a dozen events, they can do amazing things with them. Right. I mean, the, the thing that really interests me about BB, first of all, it's a very interesting topology. If you just search for BB bar at Atlas or CMS, you get too much background. There's no way you can possibly do it just by looking at BB bar. So they look in association with a, a heavy boson. Uh, and that's why we end up with dive boson backgrounds. So you tag the event with one of these bosons and then you look for the other boson that came to BB bar. And then that's where you're, where you have this dive boson plus Higgs analysis, um, and where you look at all of those backgrounds plus the Higgs signal. Now, we've seen BB bar at Tevatron uh, back in July, um, but I was a bit skeptical of this. Uh, and I was waiting really to see the LHC um, 
frequency and observation in this channel. So I was happy to see CMS got 2.2 sigma now. Um, yeah, that's, that's right, 2.2. As we gather more data, that will increase towards Morion. Um, but Atlas actually see a bit of deficit. So in the 2011 data, we're sort of below the expected line, so as the expected limits, and we end up below, we get a deficit of events compared to what we'd expect. In 2012, it's above the expected, we get an excess. And when you average these out, we're just below the expected. So ads don't really see anything at the moment uh, in BB bar. But we're less sensitive than CMS. Though. Right, yeah, the, the statistics are not so good. Um, at the end of the day, neither the Tevatron experiments, nor Atlas, nor CMS can say we're seeing BB bar for sure, or we definitely can't say we're not seeing it. Um, it, it is worth noting, I, I'd like to note this, that this, the CMS analysis, as he said, is a little bit more sensitive. I'm actually going to a meeting right after this uh, to see if we can try to understand what the differences are. Um, and I imagine the folks from Atlas are also going to be very interested in understanding those differences. Mm -hmm. Because as with most things, these detectors were built in the same, using different techniques, but to solve the same problems with roughly the same capabilities. Um, so we expect similar performance with the same amount of data from both. I also wanted to talk about the Tower Tower result because right. the last time CMS presented this, there seemed to be a bit of a deficit of events. Um, we'll just talk quite, about this. Yeah, so. quite, quite, a, quite a significant deficit of events, really. Uh, they seemed to be on the verge of at 95% confidence, which is not you know a slam dunk, but it's getting there, of actually excluding the standard model Higgs at the same mass that other channels were seeing it. So that would have been exciting potentially because it could have meant we had something like a Higgs that refused to decay to, decay to Taus, and we would have had to figure out what that meant. Um, our updates for, for both Atlas and CMS now tell us that the, what we see is essentially consistent with the standard model. Yeah. Although, again, the statistics are limited in that channel. We're not, we're not done. We can't say anything definitively. Well, the cool thing about Tau Tau is that the Tau is a fermion. And so far, the experiments have seen, you know, without question, the vector decays. So Higgs to WW star, Higgs to ZZ star, and Higgs to gamma gamma. What we haven't seen for sure is Higgs to VV bar or Higgs to tau tau, although we're getting evidence for that now. So what I really want to see is the Higgs to tau tau analysis is updated from the Morion conference in March. I, I want to see a signal there because that tells us it's standard model Higgs. If we don't see it, then we've got a fermiophobic Higgs, uh, one that doesn't like to decay to fermions. Although, I mean, we're, we're already in a strange yeah. position sure where uh, the fermion decays. Let's see here. The fermiphobic Higgs uh, would not look like what we're seeing because the fermions affect not only the decay of the Higgs, but also the processes in which it's created. The rate at which we see uh, gamma gamma events would be changed, uh, for example, the rates at which we see everything. Uh, so we're going to actually be very surprised if this is anything but a standard model Higgs at this point. Right. I mean, a lot of people will be confused, and including both of us, of course, if we don't see the Tau Tau final state. Um, that would say that would tell us that there's something else out there which is coupling strongly enough to take into account this deficit from the Higgs production, but also coupling weakly enough that we don't see it yet. <laughs> so I think uh, everyone's looking out to see this Tau Tau in a few months' time. And uh, I'd like to say as well that in this, uh, sorry, in, in HCP we also saw the um, Atlas Higgs to WW star um, analysis, which didn't make it into the uh, seminar back in July, but did make it into subsequent publication. Uh, and this is one of the uh, stronger channels for the Vectons, because the Higgs coupling to WW is very large, W decaying to leptons has got a very high branching fraction, it's about 10% per lepton compared to 3% for the ZZ star. But the problem is, we then have neutrinos, and dealing with neutrinos at this kind of mass is really difficult. Um, the way we do this is we take a look at everything else in the, de in the detector, and we sum up all the momentum in the transverse plane, and then work out what momentum recalls against that that can't be constructed. And that is our missing energy. Now the problem with this is that it depends on how well we reconstruct all of our jets around the rest of the detector in the transverse plane. And so as we get to lower and lower masses, this gets more and more difficult to do. So it's really cool that both Atlas and CMS have actually seen the WW star result, in spite of the fact that in 2012, our measurement of the missing transverse energy is really, really hard as we get to lower masses. It's, it's, it's worth just re reminding everyone that the reason we have to do all of that is that neutrinos themselves can't be stopped by our detectors. Right? Neutrinos usually pass straight through the Earth without hitting anything. 
and the Earth is a lot thicker than our detectors are. So it's all it's all about inferring um, where they were. Um, right. So, so that whole issue means that the the spread of uh, WW events in terms of the apparent Higgs masses you see um, is really large. So you don't know. Um, you can't say we have an excess in one place. You say we have a broad excess, and both Atlas and CMS uh, now see these broad excesses. Um, back in the summer, Atlas actually had a much larger excess than was expected. I don't know if that's um, proceeded a little bit or not. Oh, I've not looked at the latest uh, plots for that, uh, I must confess. Uh, I think it's receded a bit. I think it's not quite as, as powerful as it was back in July. Um, Back, back in July, it looked like we had a big excess over the standard model, but of course, not not with too much significance yet. Right. I mean, in July, we were statistically limited in pretty much you know most of our channels, and so maybe fluctuations up or down. And, and as we added more data, that effect has uh, started to smooth out a bit. So um, that, that has got quite lucky with a lot of its modes back in July. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to emphasize. This is something that's easy to forget. Um, when we do all this statistics, like we we mean our our error bars mean what they say, right? When we say, you know, we have let's let's say as we do in the in the case of the um, Higgs to BB bar, we have like it's something like 0.8 plus or minus 0.6 times the standard model cross section is our best fit for the cross section. Um, we we mean that it's consistent. It's also almost consistent with there being no Higgs boson. Right. And if our number were 1.2 next time, you shouldn't be surprised because it's in the error bars. Mm -hmm. um, and so as time passes and we update, these results should move. If they don't move by the size of the error bars, we've done something wrong and overestimated our error bars before. That's how statistics works. Um, so we are still in the stages where we know we see things, but um, if you pay attention really to how our results change, you you can think you're learning more than you really are. <laughs> Although I should uh, say as well that one of the things that interested me is Higgs to gamma gamma seems to be um, a bit high in think both experiments. Am I correct in saying yeah. that? So I think for Atlas we had 1.8 times the standard model, plus or minus 0.4. I, I might be right. slightly well, off on those numbers. And that would be really exciting because if that's actually uh, a real effect. If that's not a, a result of these, the those statistics or the, some mismodeling of our backgrounds, for example, then that means that there's some additional charged particle that we haven't discovered yet, because that's the way that Higgs decays to gamma gamma. You have a Higgs coming along, it forms a loop with a charged particle in there, and then we get two photons coming up. If we know the masses of the charged particles and their spins, we can predict how quickly, sorry, how often, I should say, the Higgs boson decays to gamma gamma. When we put our standard model particles in there, we get it low compared to what we see in the data. So I'm really interested to see if there's some new charged particle on that loop. Um, but uh, yeah, of course the error bars are still big there. Yeah. Um, one thing to note is actually that was all back in the summer that Atlas and CMS actually both had big excesses, well, seemingly big excesses in gamma gamma. Mm -hmm. um, and there actually wasn't an update of that channel by either experiment for HCP. Um, you can look forward to them, them being updated for the Morion conference next year. Mm -hmm. um, but from, from the expected, uh, perspective of the experiments, um, we, we publish analyses when they're finished. Um, and these were ongoing. Um, so it's very much worth looking forward to once we have more statistics. And as physicists as well, if we have the choice between putting more and more labor into our gamma gamma mode, which has already been seen, or into a new mode, which we've not seen yet, we're gonna go for the new mode. We're gonna make sure that we show our BB bar, our tau tau, and that we actually see, uh, as we approach sensitivity, whether or not we're seeing an excess there. Uh, I, I'm actually really glad that both experiments chose to do that and say, look, we've got BB bar and tau tau, and we've also got combinations of all these measurements. Let's put those out there, rather than, let's just update what we've already seen. <laughs> Although, I, I think, Look, looking at the meeting rooms most days, I think I think we have the people for all of, for all of these <laughs> yes. channels at the same time. That's certainly our strategy because right now the Higgs is the the possible Higgs, I should say, is the right. one exciting discovery uh, here at the LHC. We really want to nail it down. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time we fi finish analyzing all of our data from 2012, once in fact we're done taking it, um, then 
we're really hoping to have a few more things nailed down right now. Um, maybe to see these fermion decays, um, you know, and measure spins and so on and so forth. These are, these are things we're really excited about doing. Um, one of the things that we're looking at as well, I know both Atlas and CMS have got an analysis session for Higgs to Z Gamma. Uh, I'm one of the people working on that on Atlas. And that's a really interesting mode uh, for a few reasons. First of all, it goes through the same loop the Gamma Gamma goes through, so it's sensitive to new charged particles that we've not seen before. But it's also an example of the kind of Higgs analysis that you can only do once you know what the Higgs mass can be. Um, searching for Higgs to Z Gamma in a really wide mass spectrum really doesn't work because it's such a rare decay. But now we know where to look, we can blind that small signal region in data, which means we don't look at that until the very end. We can do uh, a complete analysis on everything else except that, get a good idea of what our backgrounds are and how to understand them. And then at the last um, moment, then you unblind, you get permission to unblind, and you take a look at your um, signal region. And what we're measuring there is the signal strength. We're measuring how many events we get, not the location of the peak. Uh, it's, I think it's really exciting that we're now at a stage where we can start to look at these analyses. And if we see something there, um, well, first of all, it will be quite a few um, times the standard model, so it will be elements of new physics if we see something there. Um, and, but we're also looking towards the future. We're going to have uh, a long shutdown period, and then after that shutdown period, we're going to have much higher luminosity. We'll know where to look for the Higgs, and that's when we'll start to see these modes. And I think it's very exciting that we can start to make progress on those modes at, at this point, now that we know where the Higgs has got to be. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, we, we've, we, we've, we've already achieved, I think, a lot. Um, we're, pro we're unlikely at this point, I should say, to have any really groundbreaking new news um, from, from this year's run. Um, the, the, the main goal was to really define this thing, or show it wasn't there. We've achieved that. We've started the process of measuring it. Um, we, will ha we will have more at, after the end of this year. And we will have two years of no data, during which I suppose we, we can do a lot of preparation for when data comes in again. Um, or make sure our detector's still working nicely. And does, there's a little bit of wear and tear to being next to the LHC for a couple of years, as it turns out. Um, but then, you know, then I guess we'll, we'll be back and we'll see what we see. Well, in my experience, when we have a, a shutdown period, actually, we get better analyses coming out because we end up in a situation where we're no longer updating our recommendations. So um, this probably happens on CMS as well, but at Atlas, somebody will say something like, uh, you know, we've got better measurements, we've done some uh, better studies of this kind of background over here, and this gives us better calibration. And then everybody has to update their analyses. And that actually improves the analysis, but that keeps happening again and again and again as we get more and more data coming in and better and better calibrations. Um, during the period of long shutdown, we get an opportunity to perform precision analyses where we don't have to worry about keeping Dating and adding more data. We end up in a situation where we have state of the art selections, we can take our time combining these different measurements or cross checking them. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some really interesting results coming out that said, okay, let's take this model here, let's take our best understanding of our detector and our data and see what we can do with this model. Uh, I'm actually drawing on experience in all different groups. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, that's, that's often something I think would be. Uh, it would be great if we could collect all the data and then analyze it. Um, we actually we have a very grueling conference schedule where it's really tough to you know, update what an electron is and then update your analysis of electrons. And meanwhile, your tr triggers keep changing. This is what we actually work on day to day. It's not, um, you know, it, it's fun to say, oh, here's all our results. Here's all their significances. What we work on day to day is keeping up with really how do how do we run these things correctly? How do we take the expertise from people who study simpler objects with the detector and generally keeping the detector working and how do we apply these expert, this expertise to the analyses? How do we run over this tremendous amount of data distributed on computers over the world? Um, and so we, we get through that barely and then right before conferences, we take a look and say, okay, here's what we have this time. Okay, so thanks Steph for yeah. joining me for this and thank you thanks. to the audience for watching. Yeah. Look forward to the next update. Okay, bye. bye.